Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today I am correcting a major oversight I made in one of my previous videos. As you'll recall, a couple of episodes ago, I covered the history of the ViewMaster series of stereoscopic viewers. And while I tried to give a fairly detailed overview of the various models of ViewMaster that were produced over the years, as some of you pointed out, I missed a big one, which was the Talking ViewMaster. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. So the Talking ViewMaster was introduced in 1970 by General Annaline and Film, which was the company that owned the ViewMaster brand at that time. And the idea was to compete in the emerging electronic toys market by producing a ViewMaster that not only gave you 3D images, but also short sound bites to accompany each one. And Although today this would be very easy to do using a solid state sound chip, you have to remember this was the early 1970s. They did have compact tape recorder technology, but this probably would have been too expensive and complicated to put in a children's toy. So GAF turned to the oldest recording technology in history, the phonograph. So in addition to being a stereo viewer, this is also an ultra compact record player and it would take photo reels that were largely identical to the standard ViewMaster reels with seven stereo pairs, but with an important difference. On the other side is a miniature clear plastic phonograph record, clear so that the light could actually go through the record and reach the photographs. And this would have seven tracks to line up with the seven images. And to ensure that the two lined up, just like on a regular ViewMaster reel, you had a little symbol, an arrow and a V that had to be set on top when you loaded it into the device. And that would ensure that the proper sound clip played with the proper photograph. And these reels typically came in sets of three in these nice boxes. This particular one is a Popeye set and it came with three reels and a little book there with illustrations from the photos inside the reel. So let's actually have a look at the overall design. The top half of this is pretty much identical to a regular ViewMaster. You have your two eyepieces, you have your slot at the top for loading the reels, you have your reel advance lever on the side, and then you have your light inlet here with a pair of Fresnel lenses in order to collimate and focus the light. Now, there are a couple of other controls on this, however. For example, we have this little button at the top here. This is a reset button that you push in between loading reels to ensure that the first track on the record lines up with the first set of images on the reel. And then you have your sound bar here, and this is what you push in order to start the record player and play the sound. And then you have a grill right here for the speaker. And I'm going to open this up and show you what's actually on the inside. It's probably not what you expect. This is it taken apart, and if you look inside, this is a remarkably simple mechanism. And I must admit, when I first took this apart, I was expecting there to be more electronics. I was expecting at least an electric speaker in here. But no, the only electric component in this entire unit is an electric motor to drive the disc. Everything else is mechanical. This is basically a plastic, miniaturized Victorian gramophone. So how this works is that when you drop the reel in and you press the sound bar, what it's going to do is push this entire motor assembly down, engaging a gear onto the record to actually start spinning it, and also engaging this electric contact here, which turns on the motor. And then the sound is picked up by this needle on the end of this long plastic arm. And as it vibrates within the groove on the record, it transfers those vibrations to this speaker cone right here. So this is just a direct mechanical system with no electric intermediary. Again, basically just a Victorian gramophone. Now, in order to ensure that the photos, the stereo pairs and the audio is synced up, you have to start the needle at the outside edge of the record. And then you need to be able to advance it from track to track as you go along. And this is done by this little ratchet mechanism that you can see right here. And every time you hit the advance arm and you turn to the next stereo pair, it's also going to push the needle 
further into the record from track to track. And in between each track, once it's done, that needle will ride inside of a runout groove until you advance it to the next. And you keep going until you reach the seventh and final track. And then when you want to put in a new reel, you push that little red button and that disengages the ratchet and resets the needle to its original position. So then you are ready to put in another disc and it will be synced to the first set of stereo images, provided of course that you align the top of the reel with that V and arrow symbol. So remarkably simple, but this simplicity came at a price. These were known to have absolutely abysmal sound quality, but to find out if that's true, why don't we actually put some batteries in this, stick in a reel, and see how it actually sounds. Right, so let's see how well this works. So unfortunately, this unit came with a broken cover for the battery compartment, so I wired it up with some alligator clips to some external batteries. So we're gonna stick our reel in. There's a double slot here to make sure that you insert it the right way around. And you have to keep the V arrow pointed upwards to sync up the sound with the image. We're gonna hit our reset button on the top and it should be ready to go. So let's push the sound bar and see what we can hear. That's the end of it. Go to the next. Hmm. Looks like they mixed up their Popeye reels with their Exorcist ones. Now you're probably thinking, okay, that's crappy sound by modern standards, but it was probably okay back in 1970. And uh, no, no, it wasn't. Uh, even JAF realized that this was kind of horrible. And so in 1974, they introduced an improved version, which had an electronic pickup for the needle, as well as an amplifier, a volume control, and an electric speaker. And the following year in 1975, they introduced a headphone jack, which improved the sound even more. And in 1984, they introduced a completely revamped version of the Talking Viewmaster with a completely new form factor and a number of mechanical improvements over previous models, including a sapphire needle and a constant speed controller for the disc. They also abandoned the old combined reel and disc format and went to cartridges that had a separate reel and disc. And also, instead of having a silent runout groove between each track, instead it had a constant tone, a beep that would cue you, once the track was finished, to advance to the next set of images. Then finally, the last iteration of the Talking Viewmaster was released by Tyco Toys in 1997. And here, instead of using the traditional Viewmaster reels, it used a continuous loop of film in a cartridge, and instead of a disc, it used a new modern sound chip. So anyways, there is a brief overview of the Talking Viewmaster. My apologies for missing that the last time, but that is not the end of the video because I recently came across a large collection of Viewmaster accessories, including all the accessory that I spoke about in my previous video for making your own Viewmaster reels. So let's actually have a look at those. Right, so the first item in this collection of Viewmaster accessories that I acquired was a Model D Viewmaster. So this was introduced in 1955 and was sold until 1972. And what you'll notice at first glance is that this doesn't have any sort of light inlet at the back. And this is because this is an internally illuminated Viewmaster. So if I pull it apart, you take off this little knob at the bottom and it just pulls apart. You'll see there's a compartment here for two D-cell batteries as well as a little light bulb. And if you don't happen to have any batteries, this can also be externally powered. And the box comes with a little three volt transformer and that plugs into a little socket at the bottom of the unit. Now, otherwise you have fairly standard Viewmaster controls. You insert your reel into this V-notch at the top. You have your advanced lever here on the side 
You also have two other controls that aren't found on most other Viewmasters. You have your light bar here, which is labeled Viewmaster. You push that to turn on the internal light. And also, and this is a unique feature of this particular model, you have a focusing knob, kind of like on a pair of binoculars. And that moves these lenses in and out and allows you to focus based on your eyesight. And because of all of these different features and the quality of manufacture, uh, these were considered to be the ultimate Viewmaster, the Cadillac of Viewmasters, which explains why they were sold for so many years. However, most of the items in this collection are from the personal Viewmaster line, which was introduced in 1952 and which allowed you to produce your own Viewmaster reels. And this includes this stereo camera, which we've covered it in my previous video on Viewmasters, as well as the accompanying flash unit and rangefinder, which I've covered in a previous video on the history of camera flashes. Links to both videos in the description. However, I also have a number of other accessories here that weren't covered in previous videos that we can look at. For example, in the bottom of the leather camera case, we have storage for a pair of filters. And these fit over the regular lenses. You thread out the cover on the lens, pop the filter in, and thread it back in. And these were used to correct for the color of the sun when shooting outdoors with type A or tungsten indoor film. And these were used to make the resulting images a little bit warmer in tone. We also have a set of corrective lenses that fit in this nice little leather case here. And these are intended for taking photos at close range between 30 and 50 feet away. And those simply clip on over the regular lenses. And there's this little flip up corrective lens right here that fits over the viewfinder. And that is intended to correct the parallax change when you shoot closer up. And there are also a number of other minor accessories, including a retaining chain for the camera, a number of other filter retaining rings, as well as one mystery item that I haven't really been able to figure out. And I'm hoping that some of you out there will be able to let me know what this is used for. And that item is this. This is a tiny incandescent light bulb with a bayonet base that is intended to be placed in place of a regular flash bulb. And when you insert this, and hit the shutter button, the light turns on. However, this light is not very bright and probably wouldn't illuminate much of anything even if you were shooting in the dark. So I really can't figure out what the purpose of such a light would be. So if any of you know, please let me know. So as I covered in my previous Viewmaster video, the Viewmaster personal camera took two rows of stereo pairs one along the top and one along the bottom of the film. And this meant that a standard roll of 35 millimeter film could hold up to 72 stereo pairs. And once the film was exposed, you would take it to your developer and you would ask them to develop it as a positive directly onto the film rather than making any prints or enlargement. And then you would have to cut out the individual photos or chips from this roll of film. However, in order to achieve the correct stereoscopic effect, you had to cut these out very precisely, too precisely for this to be done with, say, an X-Acto knife or a pair of scissors. And so Sawyers, the company that came up with the Viewmaster, sold specialized film cutters like this one. And so how this works is that you would lift up the platen here, and you would place your piece of film inside, and it would engage in this sprocket. And if you turn this knob at the front, the sprocket turns one full turn, and advances the film through. And on the film itself, there would be little alignment marks that you would use to align it with the cutter. And there's actually a light bulb underneath here with a diffuser that shines light through the film so you can make this alignment. And once it is properly aligned, you then push down the handle and it will cut the two chips out and they will fall down these little ramps here. And you can place those inside your Viewmaster reels. And so there were aluminum ones made, but the vast majority of the personal Viewmaster reels were made out of cardboard. And here is one of them that is already preloaded. And in order to insert the chips into the little pockets, you would use the high-tech specialized Viewmaster insertion tool, which is in this little envelope here. And this is basically just a pair of flat tweezers, but I guess it made the job a lot easier. And yeah, you would just put those in, and then you would write what each of the pairs was on these little hexagonal lines right here. And there you go. That is the complete process for making your own Viewmaster reels. Now, there are actually two versions of these film cutters available. This one was for the standard personal camera, 
there was another made for the Mark II camera, which was mainly released in Europe, and which took its pictures a little bit differently. The stereo pairs were actually taken in diagonal rows, and so the cutting head here was aligned differently to account for that. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you to those of you who pointed out the oversights I made in my previous video. Uh, please don't be shy to point out whenever I get things wrong. This channel is all about learning, and I'm more than willing to set the record straight if ever I make a mistake to err as human. Anyway, I had a blast looking through all of these neat accessories, which I'd previously only seen in photographs, and sort of completing the story of the Viewmaster that I started in my previous video. Though, with my luck, I'll probably come up with a whole other collection of accessories at some point in the near future. But if I do, then there'll be yet another video on this subject. It's the subject that keeps on giving. Anyways, I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.